This morning's talk uh, uh, is on normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, and it's a, a topic of increasing uh, interest in both our country and all countries as our population ages. This is, this is a disorder that you're going to see more and more of uh, over time. So what I'd like to do is sort of uh, organize this first in terms of a little bit of a, a historical perspective. And I should note that uh, in terms of disclosures, um, that I, I have received some travel and, and lecture stipends from Cognin and, and uh, some of the work that you uh, that I'll present uh, uh, was based on uh, this and other NIH uh, grants. So from a historical historical perspective, it's it's uh, not just of interest, but it's also uh, important to understand where we were and and how that relates to uh, where we are now. Um, I think um, many of you know that this is also called the Hakeem Adams uh, uh, syndrome. And the discovery of bone pressure hydrocephalus is attributed to uh, Solomon Hakim, who uh, passed away uh, last year. He um, was a, a, a Colombian uh, neurosurgeon in, in Bogota who um, had uh, seen these patients and uh, then uh, traveled up to uh, Mass General, where he shared uh, his insights with um, Adams. And uh, they published his first uh, landmark manuscript of three patients uh, that they studied. Uh, and in retrospect, two of them actually had what we now call secondary NPH. So they were not idiopathic NPH patients. But this was the pre-CT era where the, the brain truly was a black box. And the, the notion of having patients with enlarged ventricles and not having increased ICP was a rather profound uh, uh, discovery at that at that time, and and what they did was they uh, they did uh, pneumoencephalograms and uh, and they did lumbar punctures and noticed that the pressure was less than 180, and this number will come up again uh, you'll see in, in the uh, guidelines, but the term normal pressure came from those three patients in which a one single lumbar puncture was measured less than 180 millimeters of water. Um, looking back, actually Eldon Foltz, uh, who uh, was at the University of uh, California, Irvine, actually uh, had presented a case report of a patient after subarachnoid hemorrhage with hydrocephalus. And uh, if, you, if you look at Hakim's uh, original uh, manuscript uh, of the communicating <laughs> secondary NPH, uh, I guess uh, you might credit Eldon Foltz for actually describing the patient prior to that, um, but um, wasn't clever enough to call it overpressure hydrocephalus, which stuck. Uh, this is from um, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, paper that was published in the same year. Um, another historical uh, tidbit, uh, which uh, I believe is uh, true. Um, the, the other journal wasn't quite as distinguished as New England Journal of Medicine. And when it came to publishing this manuscript, if you can look at the bottom in terms of the authors, um, Hakim was convinced by his other colleagues to uh, put his authors in alphabetical order, um, which uh, was not to his benefit, uh, because Adams got first bidding. Um, but uh, that's, that's what the story is, that uh, r rather than it should have been Hakim's paper, um, he got uh, put third building because it was, uh, came in the middle of the alphabet. But if you look at the description from that paper of normal pressure hydrocephalus, the, the main point that uh, was, I think, uh, really uh, stood out to them was that this was a disorder of impaired thought. And, and the concept came out that this was a treatable dementia. And for years, and it still continues that in, in neurology textbooks, this is in the dementia chapter. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is one of the treatable dementias. And it, it really, um, you can see where it came from. Uh, these patients that they treated were really delirious and, and they uh, improved significantly. But it led to a lot of patients being treated with who were demented, who happened to have a little bit enlarged ventricles, and a lot of poor outcomes because they perhaps didn't really have NPH. And, Many of them didn't have walking uh, difficulty and gait disorders that led to very poor outcomes where few people were improving and there were a lot of complications, which led to this uh, another paper which was often quoted uh, in the uh, 1980s and, and 90, I guess it came out in 92, so it wasn't quoted in the 80s yet, 
from Van Neste, where he did a meta-analysis and looked at the uh, results, and I know this is a bit hard to read, but uh, from his analysis, uh, improvement only occurred in 36% of patients treated at that time with their diagnostic tools, and the complication rate was 28% in terms of significant severe or moderate complications uh, with a more more uh, with a severe morbidity of 7% and he basically said we should stop treating patients for this. Uh, the risk-benefit ratio was way out of balance and and, uh, and, it, and it led to a really uh, a uh, group of uh, teaching, a neurologist teaching that many of them didn't even believe this disorder existed including uh, just as, as little as 10 years ago the chairman, the former chairman at Harvard UCLA, used to think, oh, "I haven't seen this disorder. I, I, I'm not sure that it, it exists." So that's where the historical standpoint came in. Where you, uh, I think, fortunately, uh, times have changed, and there's a, a lot more uh, enlightenment, and uh, people recognize the disorder more. But the, the one thing, one take-home message here is that NPH is a falling disorder. It should be in the gait disturbance chapter of the neurology. Uh, and, and a secondary note in the dementia uh, chapters. And this is the way you should think about it because for many different reasons, this is the hallmark finding. And it's the key thing that we follow in terms of whether a patient has it and whether they improve. But uh, the medical students at UCLA taught me this uh, NPH, and I don't know who's teaching them, is the wet, whack, and wobbly uh, disorder. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to remember it. It's not quite... Uh, uh, I guess politically correct or um, uh, accurate, but it, it's a nice way to remember the triad. But th there is this classic triad that which everyone should know of gait disturbance, urinary symptoms, and dementia. That plus enlarged ventricles it, uh, sort of uh, defined the, the basic NPH criteria. So in terms of a little bit of the uh, uh, demographics, uh, the most common form is idiopathic, which means we just as of yet, don't understand what causes uh, NPH. And this is truly a disorder of the elderly with a mean age of about 74 in uh, most series. And again, I mentioned that secondary NPH are those things that we know are uh, occur after risk factors of subarachnoid hemorrhage, brain tumors, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and traumatic uh, brain injury. The incidence uh, is a little bit harder to uh, um, come across. Uh, uh, in, in European countries and other countries where they have more socialized medicine, it's a little bit easier to understand patient flows and, and where all patients must come to one hospital to um, figure out what the uh, both the incidence and prevalence is. And you can see here in the Netherlands, uh, they thought the incidence was one in 400,000. Uh, and uh, But in Sweden, um, uh, they estimated at one in 50,000 adults. Uh, actually, some of the interesting studies that come out of Japan where they've actually done studies where they've, they've taken uh, communities or cities and randomly uh, scanned uh, a certain number of elderly patients and within a certain age group to see the incidence of the large ventricles and then go back and see how many of them may have some symptoms of NPH. And you can see that among patients or, or among individuals older than 65, uh, some of the studies suggest that the incidence is around 2 to 3 percent of um, uh, people have possible uh, hydrocephalus. So uh, as you can see, as our population ages, that's going to be a significant number of uh, uh, people. So let's talk about each one of the triads now. So the magnetic gate, I think, is the classic description of uh, uh, hydrocephalus gait with normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it is one that is uh, characterized by difficulty in initiating uh, the gait. And the problem with this is that when you see it, it's classic and go, wow. But most patients probably don't have this gait. And, uh, and, and why is it called the classic or characteristic gait? Well, because these are the patients that respond significantly, and that's why we co sort of correlate it with NPH, but the, there are many overlapping disorders that can impair gait in the elderly, uh, including other brain disorders, so uh, peri uh, uh, ventricular white matter disease, this also disrupts the white matter tracts, 
patients have bad hips, bad knees, um, bad backs, other, other joint-related problems. They may have diabetic neuropathies or, or visual uh, impairments. So you can see it's hard to get a pure patient who just has NPH and doesn't might not have some other gait that kind of uh, uh, confounds the picture. And, and this actually is one of the problems with studying NPH is that it's difficult to quantify this because uh, if all patients had only this one gait, it'd be easy to try to come up with some metric, but because they have all different problems, you know, some people can't even walk, they, they're in a wheelchair for a variety of reasons, and how do you quantify that compared to something else? So here is a um, patient who I think has what I would consider the classic uh, NPH uh, gait. You can see he had a little bit of difficulty getting up from that wheelchair. He's walking down the hall here, and all of a sudden I sort of distract him, and this is what a magnetic gait is to me. You can see his feet are like stuck. He's trying to walk right now, but his feet are stuck to the ground, as if there's magnets on the bottom of his feet and, and the floor is metal. And he cannot just seem to go forward. And, and there's the agonist and antagonist muscles are all sort of going back and forth. And, and the way I think about this is that when you and I walk, we don't really think about what we're doing. We can just motor right down the, the hallway without uh, any thought because there is an automatic walking system that gets invoked that allows us to walk, allows us to go transition from grass to gravel, up steps. Um, this automatic walking system here has been sort of disconnected and he's unable to just uh, ambulate uh, because he, he just can't do it. The same gentleman though, if you take him and you say, take your left foot, take a big step, right foot, and he can march right down the hallway where he can't do it right now, but you can literally make him walk volitionally and it looks fairly normal. So that's why I, I think there's something wrong with the, the automatic walking system. The gait is, the, again, the primary issue. Bladder control is a secondary, and again, incontinence is the thing that we're taught with uh, NPH is the cardinal finding, but prior to incontinence, what you need to ask for is whether they have urinary urgency, um, because that's the early symptom, and, and you can see how it gets compounded. If you have a gait difficulty and urgency, you may not be able to make it to the restroom in time, and at first you may have incontinence due to the fact that you didn't make it in time, and then later as the disorder progresses, you just have incontinence uh, uh, that is more severe, and then very late, uh, this French term, constant, uh, Nancy, maybe you can help me out there with uh, <laughs> saint Genet. that they, they don't really know and they're completely oblivious to the uh, fact that they have uh, incontinence. And then the dementia, um, and it's been described by a, a lot of different uh, ways, uh, forgetfulness, slowness. Uh, one observation that I have is that uh, you, when you see these patients, they're, they're in the room and their family is with them, and you ask the patient, you know, how is your short-term memory? Is it bad? And the patient says no, and every family member is, is nodding yes, because they are, I don't know why, the patients are by and large largely unaware of the severity of their uh, forgetfulness and their, and their dementia. And in terms of uh, um, perspective with this, it's gait disorder and bladder control are up here, and dementia is later and less significant, and over time it catches up. So. If you see a patient that's markedly demented and a very mild gait problem, you have to think and stop and go, wow, this may not be NPH, or this may be NPH plus some other neurodegenerative disorder, because it's usually, uh, uh, again, it comes on later, and uh, it's uh, not uh, as severe compared to the gait. Also, um, when you do neurocognitive testing, you kind of flunk on, on, on all domains. So, Memory is the part that is the most profound, but they have difficulty with almost all tasks. So those, that's the triad. In terms of the imaging, um, there's um, neuroimaging criteria uh, put up, uh, that sort of been agreed upon by the uh, guidelines. This Evans ratio, you measure the maximum distance between the frontal horns here versus the maximal biparietal distance, and you get this ratio, and if it's greater than 0.3, then at least they meet the uh, sort of crude criteria for uh, 
uh, ventricular megaly. In Japan, um, they've uh, uh, noticed uh, this, uh, what's called de DESH, where you know, very markedly enlarged sylvian fissures and other uh, uh, sulci and the you know, crowding appear near the fatal sinus where you don't have, quote, atrophy uh, findings here. And um, so what they described is a tight, high convexity and then uh, enlarged subarachnoid spaces and sylvian fissures, which in the past, people uh, uh, used to think, oh, that's just atrophy. And this is, uh, you know, just age-related atrophy. But uh, it, it's interesting that uh, they have found that this, uh, actually this, this combination of findings is rather <coughs> Uh, fairly predictive of outcome, and that this may be a, a one of the signature uh, imaging findings of NPH. So, you're seeing a patient in, in the clinic, and they have a history that sounds like NPH. Uh, you know, what do you do? Well, if the patient has a rather short history, meaning within several, you know, six months to eight months, uh, with that classic gait disorder, and MRI clearly shows enlarged ventricles. Um, the, the, the literature and the experience was, well, you'll probably be right about 70% of the time. And if this is what you're taught, you go out there and be all excited to diagnose these patients. But the, the problem is that most patients don't have this presentation. And you're, you're seeing patients who are referred to you because a radiologist read ventricles slightly out of proportion to age, clinical correlation required, and they sent to you for clinical correlation. or Patients complain of imbalance, but they really don't have a mechanical walking difficulty, or they're referred to you because their their memory is failing, or because they have stress incontinence, or all sorts of other findings. And, and that's the problem and the, and the challenge of this disorder is trying to figure out what to do with the majority of patients that are sent to you who don't have this classic uh, presentation. So the differential, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, one of the things that we do see uh, is um, many patients, especially this age group, have periventricular white matter disease. And you'll see this, and it's been long argued whether this is a contraindication to shunting, or does this mean that they're not going to get better uh, with shunting? Um, uh, just recently in, uh, in Sweden, um, uh, they, they did a study where they, they took patients who basically had the, uh, quote, uh, worst uh, uh, chance of having normal pressure hydrocephalus, they had extensive periventricular white matter disease. They did CSF outflow resistance studies, which showed that they were normal. And for, for what the literature said, they shouldn't respond. And they were uh, doing a study of uh, sham shunting versus actually putting a shunt in the patient. And lo and behold, uh, they had to stop the study very soon because all these patients were improving with the regular shunt and they had to convert them away from the sham shunt and it really questions whether this uh, this should be used as an exclusionary criteria and most of us don't use it. We, we do use it to sort of, sort of curb their enthusiasm that they may not get a complete response or maybe a lesser response. But the thing in terms of my personal experience is that when I see this Almost all the patients complain of imbalance. This is their number one complaint versus, the, that's why I wanted to show you that, that video, which is different than that magnetic gait. These patients just say that I have imbalance, and my observation is that imbalance continues after uh, treatment, but some of the mechanics of the gait can improve. Others, um, I, I show this video to our movement disorder uh, uh, folks, and they go, well, that looks like Parkinson's. and, and it, it's true that some of the gait characteristics of NPH is similar to Parkinson's, um, although what I see with Parkinson's is just more of this shuffling gait that just continues. And, uh, and interestingly, NPH rarely can present with Parkinson's symptoms that are almost indistinguishable from, from uh, uh, Parkinson's uh, syndrome. Um, Alzheimer's disease, again, predominantly cognitive problems, and only late in the disease uh, do you get walking difficulty uh, just due to severe dementia. You always have to think, well, if they have predominantly gait problems, is it because of a, a spinal compression or cervical stenosis? So look for um, hyperreflexia and other findings, and then there's a list of others.
So altogether, uh, back in, uh, 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 in the early uh, 2000s, uh, a committee was formed uh, to try to come up with guidelines. And uh, uh, again, one of the uh, champions and one of the uh, uh, people who really made a huge difference in this, in, difference in this disorder, Anthony Marmoreau, uh, brought this group together from all over the world. Um, he uh, too, uh, unfortunately, passed away uh, recently, which was a huge loss uh, to, this, uh, to this field. But what we did was uh, we tried to come up with a consensus of what are the what, what should we be using to make the diagnosis of this uh, disorder because it was all over the map uh, prior to that. And being part of this and going to multiple multiple meetings, I can say that there was very little consensus, but a lot of good discussion and a compromise was uh, reached in terms of what we uh, should do. And this was the algorithm that was finally decided upon as a compromise and. Like all great compromises, uh, there's a lot of problems with it because everybody wanted to have their say so uh, in this. But I have to say, uh, one of the things that that um, I found about it was it's a bit complicated, and no one can memorize this. Um, but uh, it does include many of the basic features of you know trying to find which of the triad elements were present, including any one of them. And then look at the imaging and at the, at the uh, Evans ratio, and then what to do once you get past here um, uh, was if, the, if there was evidence that they had a triad plus a ventricular megaly. Well, uh, many people felt that you should do a lumbar puncture first, and if the ICP here was greater than 18, and you see where this number came from, this is centimeters of water. Well, uh, it was probably secondary NPH. Um, I don't think there's much evidence for this, and, uh, and I actually don't think this is true, but this was something that was um, insisted upon by uh, many of the people that uh, committee. So uh, again, there's no evidence for this. This was just based on Hakim's original description. And then uh, the Europeans wanted to have uh, measurement of CSF outflow resistance, which is basically only done in Europe. And uh, what's done in the United States is mainly the strainage protocol, which uh, somehow this looks more like the New York subway than uh, a uh, algorithm, but so many patients end up here with a shunt. And now I'll, I'll come to what we do and, and how it's a little bit uh, simplified. One of the main things here, though, is, and, it, and it's sort of a logical one, is that the treatment for this is a shunt, and drainage of CSF prior to tr uh, treating them with a definitive shunt kind of makes logical sense. If they get better if you drain them, then they're probably going to respond with a shunt. And if you look at uh, sort of this prognostic accuracy, and these are sort of estimates based on the literature and gestalt, just a standard lumbar puncture is not very uh, worthwhile here. But if you do a high volume lumbar puncture, you take out 40 or 50 cc's, the, the prognostic accuracy is about 60 to 70%. If you do extended lumbar drainage uh, for two to three days, it approaches 80 to 90%. And, and then what people have extrapolated out and said, well, a shunt must be the best thing, you know, it's here's little more, a shunt must be the highest. And the second take home message I want to bring home is that that's not true. You know, a shunt actually incorporates a whole range here, depending on what kind of valve you have, what the patient's ICP is, how old they are, how obese they are. To think that a shunt always drain more than a lumbar drain is absolutely incorrect. And and I will come back to this, that this is a fallacy, this thinking that a shunt is here of the interpretation of many of the uh, so-called supplemental or diagnostic studies of MPH. So I'm going to hit on a few of them. So a high volume lumbar puncture, again, uh, most people would recommend 40 to 50 cc's. It's relatively easy, relatively inexpensive. You don't have to hospitalize the patient. But the problem with it is that it has a high a relatively high rate of false negative results, which means that if, if it, you see a profound response, it's probably a good study, but if you don't, you should not use it to exclude the patient because they still might respond to a shunt. So you can think of it as sort of taking the cream off the, you know, off the top, but uh, where it's misused as, as, as an exclusionary test. The other problem with it is that there are false positives. and as I mentioned before, especially with gait, if you focus a patient and make them concentrate on their gait, they can walk better. So 
you bring a patient in, you do a lumbar puncture, you get them up afterwards, and okay, okay, Mr. Smith, I want you to take some big steps here and don't march right down the line and go, wow, they're better. But the reality is that you just may have biased your outcome by doing this. And um, there are um, there's some evidence that suggests that when you actually look at videos before and after, there's actually other biases, including the physician and the family was basically thinking the patient was better, but people who looked at the video said, hey, wait a second, we don't really see any difference. So there's many different reasons why a lumbar puncture test uh, has its problems, and, and it's largely why we don't use it here very often. We rely largely on external lumbar drainage, uh, for which there are no established guidelines of how to do this. The original um, uh, study who did it uh, Pick 10 cc's an hour for three days. Um, the, the original description uh, of this uh, out of Europe uh, had a 25% subdural hematoma rate and 10% uh, infection rate. And it's amazing that it ever survived <laughs> to come to today. But the, the way we do it now is, is much uh, safer, and uh, although it still has its uh, potential complications. But Marmoreau in, in, at Medical College of Virginia did this prospective study of 151 uh, patients and so that it had a positive predicted rate of 89%, which is really outstanding. And there's actually not many tests in medicine that have that type of positive predictive rate. And to me, you know, this is the gold standard, and, and any other test has to uh, uh, meet uh, this. So but what are the problems with it? Well, it may need specialized nursing. You know, in, in many places, this is done in the ICU, which is at greater expense. Uh, we have. Uh, 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 fantastic nurses here that have been trained, and, and we do it here on the ward. Uh, the complication rate has been uh, reported to be uh, anywhere from two to eight um, uh, percent. We, and I know that Hopkins, has, uh, both have had one death related to lumbar drainage uh, from uh, uh, gram-negative meningitis. So there are risks, and particularly because the patients are demented, they get up. They pull on things, and, and, and that's one of the risks uh, of this. And you, you somewhat have to screen for that prior to uh, doing this test. If you have a, uh, a puller or a yanker, you don't want to uh, do this uh, uh, test. And you could have equivocal results here as well because symptoms may wax and then wane. And, uh, and in some cases, you, might, you, you may not want to pick a patient who hasn't walked for five years because uh, they may be so deconditioned, there's no way they are going to walk right after this test, or if they have contractures. And uh, in terms of doing this, uh, uh, spinal headaches is one of the things that really confounds this test. If it's not recognized and treated, and it's, I, I hate to blame things on interns, but the, the problem here is that a patient complains of a headache, the intern reflexively orders narcotics, which mentally wipes out these patients and for three days they are in la-la land and then they pull out and then, they're, and then they go home and we never know what happened. But if you get spinal headaches, just lower the rate to five cc's an hour and the spinal headaches will essentially go away and don't treat it with narcotics is one, one of the things that uh, we've learned. There are other tests that have been proposed and uh, due to time constraints, I'm not gonna go over them. Um, and part of it because I'm not a believer in them personally. CSF alpha resistance is all the rage in Europe. They really believe in this. The problem is there's CSF alpha resistance when they do normal studies goes up in age and there are no normalized charts to actually figure out what is correct for age. And um, it takes a long time. It takes an hour. You need special equipment. And the uh, reason it's not used in the United States is because uh, uh, there's no reimbursement for it. So an hour of your time for a test that's marginal at best uh, uh, isn't, uh, doesn't occur here. Um, the one thing that we did agree upon with our consensus committee was that uh, cisternograms were almost meaningless, and uh, so we uh, did not put that in the protocol. And CSF aqueductal flow velocity is uh, something that's exciting. It's, uh, it's non-invasive, but there's too many conflicting reports right now to know what it really means. So here's sort of our protocol, and much simpler in a nutshell. You see a patient, you see whether they sort of fit the clinical criteria, 
you know, if they had that classic NPH where it's just screaming at you, oh, this is NPH, well, you may do nothing or maybe just do a pap test or some other test and go straight to the shunt. This is the minority. Most patients go down this limb where they get external lumbar drainage. If they respond, they get a shunt. If they don't, we follow them. And I, I think this is a much simpler uh, protocol to uh, follow. So in terms of treatment, and now the patient has responded to a lumbar drain and we're going to uh, go with treatment, you know, sort of have two goals. One is to minimize complications, and the second one is to maximize uh, effectiveness. Sort of a, not that unique to NPH, but to understand how to do this, first understand what the subdural hematoma rate is. Um, in the literature, it's, it ranges anywhere from 3 to 20 percent uh, in terms of subdural hematomas. Um, our rate is about 4 percent, and, and I will argue it will never be zero when you have elderly patients who tend to fall down for other reasons who are on aspirin. Uh, it, will, it will never be zero. Shunt infection, uh, if you look at large prospective studies, mainly pediatric, almost all of them are around 8 to 10 percent infection rate. I think NPH is, is different because uh, there's fewer revisions in NPH and maybe the immune system is more mature, but our rate is less than 1%. Uh, but what, what I found uh, uh, sort of remarkable, you know, when you think about how, how many patients that I have to revise, and, you know, I would have guessed it was somewhere about 5 7%, but when we looked at five-year outcome, um, the number of the percentage of patients that had some problem with a shunt that had to bring them back in for a re revision was about 18 percent. But fortunately, most of these were minor, and patients improved. So, I mentioned this before that NPH is a misnomer, and it's, this is not my idea. Uh, it is, uh, by and large, lower pressure than pediatric or young adult hydrocephalus. But the thought that it is truly normal pressure is incorrect. So, here's data from. Um, uh, what we measured at UCLA when we did a prospective study, uh, prior to the lumbar drain, uh, we put Cognin interparenchymal ICP monitors and measured them at different head of bed elevations of the ICP. So these are individual patients. And you can see here that the intracranial pressure here, we converted to millimeters of uh, water, ranged from 250 all the way down to 50. But you know, uh, if you think that it has to be less than 180, you're missing a lot of these patients, and these are all idiopathic NPH patients. So the range is quite significant. 70% of patients have B waves at night when they're sleeping. We don't really know what it is for the normal population. We think it's lower, but it's not zero. And, and here's a patient who actually had like a mini plateau wave during their sleep. So to think that it's normal pressure isn't uh, uh, correct for all patients. But Please remember this and the shape of the curve here. Uh, you kind of guess this when you're sitting upright, your ICP is lower than it's when it's down. So much of our treatment and the valve design and all that has been really aimed at one thing, and it's this, trying to prevent subdural hematomas. And for 30 years, one thing has been blamed for this, siphoning, upright drainage, when, when, uh, because uh, humans are, uh, most of us are uh, upright individuals. So. This was, this was thought to be the culprit, and the number of valves and, and, and other accessories that have come out to prevent siphoning has spawned the whole industry and people proclaiming that you have to put these in there to prevent uh, overdrainage. And I want to argue that the key is to really understand ICP dynamics and what happens with the ICP or the shunt. So here's two misconceptions from my perspective. One is the misconception that subdurals are caused by siphoning. Now, there's actually very little evidence. It sort of maybe makes sense, but there's very little objective evidence that that's true. And one of the evidence against it is that uh, you put in all these devices and patients still got subdural hematomas. And, and the other one is, well, it goes along with the siphoning issue is that, well, if you just put a standard differential pressure valve, that's going to siphon and, and that's what causes subdural. So, this is an X. I don't think this is true. And the other one is that what many people do is they put the ventriculostomy in the time of surgery, they measure the pressure, the opening pressure, and let's say it's uh, 140, they say, hmm, I better put a valve that's 130 in there, lower than the opening pressure, because shoot, it's not going to work if I put a valve that's greater than the opening pressure. Makes sense? Absolutely wrong. No, no evidence for it, and I'll show you the evidence against it. 
So why is that? Well, let's talk about uh, uh, Shantology here. Um, this is a sort of a little diagram here. It's the brain, ICP, reservoir, valve, peritoneal catheter. So you have a distal cavity pressure in your abdomen for a VP shunt. You have a vertical distance. This is a siphoning issue. You have a differential pressure valve. It's offsets here, and you have intracranial pressure. So if you put these together, you can sort of say, well, I can calculate what the ICP should be because it has to do with the opening pressure. Think about each portion here. Higher opening pressure should be higher ICP. You have the negative effect of the uh, vertical distance here. This is the straw or the siphoning effect. So the greater the distance here, the more negative pressure ICP should be generated. And then the distal cavity pressure, obesity should have more back pressure, and therefore your ICP should be higher. So you can see where the pluses and the minuses and how it all makes sense. And this is really a reorganization of Portnoy's equation. And the point here is that this is based on non-pulsatile CSF laminar flow, uh, these assumptions of this equation. So here's an example. You have somebody, you put a valve in of uh, an opening pressure of 70, a uh, rather tall individual with a distance here of 400 millimeters between their brain and their abdomen. Uh, distal cavity pressure is 100. You would guess that their ICP upright, therefore, should be minus 230 millimeters of water, while in the terms of, uh, you know, that sucks, which means they should be, that's siphoning, and they, this, is, this is, quote, the cause of subdural diplomas. I'm going to argue that it's not, because if you, Take that and you graph it out graphically. Now, this is a compilation of all those curves that I showed you before. So this is prior to a shunt. This is the mean ICP. And, then, and if you graph out uh, all those lines, you'll see here that there's a series of lines, each one for each opening pressure of the valve. That's calculated by Portnoy's equation. So any valve pressure above the intracranial pressure should theoretically result in no drainage, right? Valve pressure is too high. Valve pressures that are too low or in, in the upright position, this is quote unquote siphoning. So this is where the valve is draining too much. So we did a study here, a prospective study, where again, we took these patients that we monitored prior to their lumbar drain, so they're sort of virgins at that point. We monitor what their baseline settings were. And then we did a VP shunt. We put another pressure monitor in the brain we also put a pressure monitor into the peritoneum at the time of the VP shunt placement, so we actually measured their peritoneal pressure simultaneously with their uh, brain pressure, and we sat them up and measured pressure at all the different settings, and we measured it at all these different valve settings. So you can tell it took about an hour and a half to do this on each single patient afterwards, and we have this data on, on two days. So here's what we expected to find, and here's what we found. And, and there's a couple things to notice here. Again, the dark line is the pre-shunt, and here's the series of lines for all those different valve settings. So what's the first thing that we saw was, well, we didn't see siphoning. We didn't see what we thought we were going to find, what, where you would think that there would be this, all these significant negative pressures. And the, the one thing that I think is profound is that the intracranial pressures with a shunt are almost physiologic in the curve. And what you're doing is you're just lowering that curve down as you lower the valve pressure. So yes, you do get more negative pressures with lower valve settings, but you don't get dramatically lower pressures here. It just it looks almost physiologic. So this really question, you should then question, well, why do we even need, quote, gravitational valves, anti-siphon devices and all that if we're trying to prevent something that doesn't occur? The second thing is even more profound is that this under drainage did not by and large occur across patients. And what you see here is that even at 200, the pressure is lower at every single point along this uh, head of bed elevation than it was uh, uh, before. And if you look at the data, this is in the supine flat position, pressure set at 200. So prior to surgery, pre-op, Mean pressure for the group of patients was 164 millimeters of water, post-op 125 with a valve of 200. So you should look at this and go, oh, wait a second, you know, there's something wrong here. There's, this doesn't make any sense. So I will argue, well, it's because 
you just don't you haven't quite thought it all out yet. And this is exactly what happens. And this is probably the cause of organ drainage is that we've been putting bowel pressures that are way too low in our patients. So here's two patients from this group to, I think, uh, demonstrate what I think is happening here. So you have the a line here of pre-op mean ICP. And this is a fallacy that we always think about mean ICP. That mean ICP, is, here's a waveform from that patient of continuous ICP recordings. And uh, this is like, you know, thinking of the ocean as a one constant uh, level, but ignoring that it has tides and waves that uh, there are pressures markedly higher than the mean ICP. So we measured the mean ICP before. We measured the peritoneal pressure after the shunt, but we assumed that it was the same as before the shunt. And if you add the peritoneal pressure to a valve pressure of 200, you can see that there are peaks that are above the valve pressure and the peritoneal pressure combined. All valves, because of the FDA, have to have a one-way valve mechanism. So what you see here is Pressure peaks, CSF is pushed past the valve but cannot come back, and what you have is a mini pump. It just basically keeps squirting ICP out until it lowers the ICP. And in this case, the post-operative ICP was lower than the mean ICP, even though the valve was set at 200. Versus this patient, here's a valve at 200, the peritoneal pressure is way up here, their pulse utility was not as high, and the pre and the post ICP were identical. So. You need to think of pulsatile ICP dynamics and how it interacts with a one-way valve, I think, to understand overdrainage. And it's siphoning is probably part of the problem, but it is not, I think, the problem. The problem is we just simply put in too low pressure valves for too long in these patients. And um, if you look at the original you know, Dutch NPH studies, they were putting in pressure valves of 30 to 40 millimeters of water or 50 or 60 on all the patients. And it's no, uh, you know, looking at this data, there, there's no reason to be shocked that there was such a high over drainage rate uh, back then and it wasn't due to uh, uh, siphoning. So what is it, why are we putting in a shot? What is the goal? Is it to lower ICP? Is it to reduce ventricle size? Are we trying to improve blood flow around the brain? Well, I mean, obviously we're trying to improve the, the patient and that's the most important uh, 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 goal here. So, um, how do we select what valves uh, to choose then if based on this uh, data? Well, uh, ZMAC out of Sweden uh, did a large study of uh, with the Cobb Hakim programmable valve, and he found out that you know at the end after they made all the adjustments that the mean median valve pressure was 140 to kind of give you an idea where it was. So. 15 years ago, everyone was getting valve pressures in the 40 to 50 to 60 range. Now you see that it was much higher uh, than that. We, we looked at 116 patients, uh, and um, again, all of them initially set at 200, and our data actually is very similar to theirs. With a VP shunt, the median pressure, valve pressure was 130, and for a VA shunt, it was 140. But here, this is important. The range was all the way from 20 to 240. So to think that all the patients are going to be this way is a fallacy way, way higher than that. So if you look back to this Dutch NPH study where they actually did a prospective study, they randomized patients between low and medium pressure valves. Uh, uh, so it's very good in that uh, respect of the way the study was done. If you look at the subdural hygroma rate with low pressure valves, 70% of their patients got subdural hygromas. Medium pressure valves, and this is about 30, I mean, this is about 50 to 90, this is uh, 30 to uh, 40, but in terms of opening pressures, 30% of patients with medium pressure valves. We looked at our data, starting at 200, 3% of our patients got subdural hygromas. So, you know, a little graphing calculator and, and, and Photoshop can tell you that you almost have a line there, and you can almost pick whatever subdural hygroma rate you want based on if you just arbitrarily pick, well, I'm going to shunt everybody at 100. Well, then if you go to 100, you're going to see that, well, I'm going to have about 20% subdural hygroma rate based on sort of this extrapolation of, of data. So I don't think that's a very, uh, well, if that's acceptable with you, that's fine. But to me, uh, our goal should be uh, zero subdural hematoma. So, do subdural hygromas lead to subdural hematomas? Well, in some cases we know we know that occurs, uh, 
But we know that other cases, subdural hematomas occur rapidly due to a fall or some other reason. But it's not always the case, but subdural hygromas that are larger than eight millimeters, by and large, should be uh, viewed as a risk factor for subdural hematomas, especially in patients who are on aspirin, Plavix, et cetera. And fortunately, with programmable valves, we can just do even relatively small adjustments and uh, reverse subdural hygromas. So what do we do here? We, I start at 200 on every single patient and reduce it by 30 every two weeks or so. Basically, the patient comes back. If they're not better, I lower their valve pressure by 30. And after every other adjustment, I proactively look for subdural hygromas or even you find subdural hematomas rarely uh, and, and base it on, on that. And we just keep repeating this based on whether they have clinical improvement or if the CT now shows a reduction in ventricle size, you stop because there's no reason to continue beyond that point. And the real issue comes up, well, what happens when you get to the bottom of the valve pressure, uh, 30 or 20 or whatever? Um, uh, things that you can do if they were shunted, if you put an anti siphon device, you should remove that. Uh, you may want to convert it to a VA shunt, which we have indirect evidence that this drains more than a DP shunt, or rarely we have to go to uh, a ventriculostomy or other uh, measures. But it, it, it brings up the question is what is a non responder then? So, how do you know the patient is a non responder versus you just haven't drained them enough? And what I propose, uh, uh, for a definition is, is that a patient is, should be defined as a non-responder only when they have a reduction in ventricular size with no clinical improvement. Every time I say that, 30 hands raise up and attack me saying, are you implying that you have to have a reduction in ventricular size to have clinical improvement? And that's why I put this in red. I am not implying that that's the case because we know that many patients improve without any apparent reduction in the ventricle size. So one doesn't go with the other, but if you have a patient who has not improved, to me, you can't declare them a non-responder until you've reduced their ventricles. Based on an observation of patients that we treated uh, uh, almost 20 years ago here, where this, this low-pressure hydrocephalus sy uh, syndrome, which is sort of NPH on steroids, and these patients were elderly patients, uh, some of them who were almost comatose or who had zero intracranial pressure, and until we brought their ventricle size down, they didn't improve. Despite subatmospheric drainage, we were down at minus 15, minus 20 centimeters below the, the tragus. It, it didn't matter how much CSF we responded, the day that their ventricles came down in size, we could tell because all of a sudden they, they, they sat up and they started talking and they were, they were markedly better. So. How does that relate to how we got to where we are today? Well, most of the NPH prognostic studies, whether it be lumbar puncture, lumbar drain, CSF outflow resistance, aqueductal flow, what they did was they, they did their study, they put a shunt in, and they said, well, patients didn't respond to the shunt, and therefore it was a bad test. And what I argue is, well, if you look at it very carefully, they never actually defined what a non-responder was, and most of those studies put anti-siphon devices in and all that, and, they, and so we really don't know whether they just undertreated the patients. So I would just leave that as something that you should really question all these studies in terms of what the prognostic uh, 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 utility of them is, with the exception of lumbar drainage, because 72-hour lumbar drainage I would argue that the shunt is actually trying to replicate that. It actually drains more than we do with a shunt, and that's why it's, it's a better study. So here's that gentleman that I showed before, six months after his shunt for the non-believers. Um, he is doing remarkably well. He was extraordinarily happy. You can see just, just how happy he is with his uh, new gained uh, independence. And he was up here making a joke, but I didn't have the audio for that. So in summary, external lumbar drainage, I think right now is the gold standard. And uh, it's what we use because it's the best test that's available. Um, to 
reduce your risks. I think it's really important to understand ICT dynamics of what you're doing and not fall into the uh, traps and the fallacies of, uh, of valve selection. Uh, it's a heterogeneous disorder uh, to think that one valve does it all. Uh, if any rep comes into your office and says, I have a shunt valve that can treat NPH, and you should just show them the door because they don't understand NPH. And this is why I think that uh, you know it's a litmus test for patients. If their surgeon doesn't use an adjustable valve, you should go find a different uh, surgeon. And that my recommendation is that you start high and gradually come down because I think it's the safest uh, uh, approach and that you should actively screen for subdural fluid collections because they are asymptomatic in most cases. I don't do this all alone. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the other people that helped me and uh, I, I ran over time, but thank you. The question is, uh, does uh, endoscopic nerve ventriculostomy, what's the role for normal pressure hydrocephalus? Um, there's a study that came out of Italy. It was a prospective, multi-center study. Um, and, and, and let me give you the background of how it was done. Uh, they did lumbar punctures in most patients and uh, went through a sort of a clinical criteria on that route. They, they shunted, I mean, they, they did ETVs on these patients and quantitatively assessed their uh, outcome with a rather complex score, which showed that there was improvement in about 70% of the patients. And that was uh, met with some skepticism and, and a lot of excitement for people who were scared of shunts in these patients due to the subdural hematomas. Um, we started a prospective study, and we're not the only ones who started that based on that study. Uh, the difference between what we did and what they did was that we did lumbar drains on every one of these patients. So when they came to that decision point of shunt versus ETV, we knew not only that they would improve, we knew that how much they might improve based on the lumbar drain. And we stopped the study because our results were actually similar to the uh, Italian study. About 70% of all, 7 out of 11 patients actually showed little improvement after ETV, but nowhere near as much as the lumbar drain. And six of those seven now have VP shunts with significant improvement. So the answer is that I don't recommend it because a few patients perhaps may have significant responses, but by and large, you're, you're under treating your patient. You know, hydrocephalus is a spectrum of CSF dynamic disorders, and um, and, and there's some and there's and, and there's some thoughts that it's actually got too much compliance in, in NPH versus in younger adults. It's a low compliance system, so I, I wouldn't generalize it to that. A high pressure valve is about 140 to 150 when, when you purchase one off the shelf. So 200. When Hakim designed this valve, and it's a Hakim programmable valve. He thought 200 was the off position, but in retrospect, you even need a higher pressure than that. And and uh, a new valve that actually just came out uh, um, that basically now has valve settings. I think starts at well, there's one at 400 and 220 and, and going down. So the programmable valves are accommodating now to this newer concept of this. So. Uh, the reason I showed the ICP data was more for you to ingrain in your mind that this is not normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now, whether the whether our goal of treatment is to lower ICP or not may or may not be the case, but it's more about understanding valve selection and putting that thought in your mind because it's a different question about what we're trying to achieve. And there's there's actually very nice studies uh, where they do. Uh, regional blood flow studies in the brain before and after uh, lumbar drains or treatment. And clearly, patients who get better have improved periventricular blood flow. And that's probably what we are accomplishing here is, uh, and how that occurs and why that occurs, we really don't understand. Um, I mentioned that patients' ventricle size doesn't change, but if you look at it volumetrically, it does. Even you measured that bifrontal distance, oh, it's the same, but if you do 3D studies, there's actually a slight reduction in ventricle size. And it could be that just that alone is enough to improve periventricular white matter blood flow, and you get a 
a uh, resolution of a neuro apraxia or a, a neuropraxia that is ischemia related. Uh, so I, I think that that's how I think about it. You know, the the concept of of arachnoid granulation under uh, um, drainage or poor absorption is a theory, and um, I'm a little iconoclastic that I don't think it is the total explanation or may even be a minor explanation of, of what's going on uh, because it certainly doesn't explain why patients improve with ETV. It may not be total improvement, but it doesn't explain that at all. And I, I think that there's much more to the story, but you know, from a simple mechanic standpoint, I kind of want to want you to understand you, you do want to not lower ICP too much. Why they improve, I can't tell you, but, but, but our fallacy and, and back to Van Nesta's study, we can't go back to there and have a horrible complication rate. We should strive for high efficacy with very low complication rate. And uh, you have to then figure, understand, well, how, how can that be when one person finds a high correlation and, and other don't? And part of it could be patient selection, meaning that uh, if, you, if you are very uh, particular and you only pick patients that are these classic NPH patients, it may be a very good study because it actually does represent the pathophysiology perhaps. But if you take all comers and like you actually see in clinic, it's probably not as a good as a good study because there's so many other factors that can confound that uh, issue. So we're actually looking at that and we, we're, we're doing uh, very accurate measures in the aqueduct and in the cisterns to see what happens uh, with uh, CSF flow dynamics. And one, one of the interesting things that we found is uh, if you look at aqueductal flow velocity, and we did normal studies to, to calibrate and get a, a normal cohort, is that it is, our, our, these are all patients who have lumbar drain uh, be, uh, testing, but the aqueductal stroke volume is higher than pH. And all these patients responded to lumbar drains. Um, you put a shunt, it actually normalizes. I'm trying to understand why that is. And if you look at the difference in aqueductal stroke volume, it actually almost matches exactly what's been measured going down the shunt on a pulse by pulse uh, value. So uh, there, there's a lot more to the story that we just don't, uh, we don't really understand. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks very much. <laughs>